Australia. Lonely distances, withering heat, blinding light. Land that asked much and gave little to the Europeans who first came here with their precise laws and strange skills. The ground broke. Their beasts went hungry or died unexpected deaths at once. And to those who stayed and learnt, the land yielded. With stubborn formality, they divided it up between the new men. One of these men was Richard Hamilton. It was 1837. Six months after South Australia was proclaimed a colony, Hamilton took up his grant of 80 acres from the sea. There he began a tradition in winemaking which has developed and matured like the city of Adelaide. The grapevines that Richard Hamilton planted more than 130 years ago were the beginning of South Australia's wine industry. Hamilton's wines have been cared for by five generations of the Hamilton family, and the vineyards which rubbed shoulders with the infant Adelaide have been a continuing part of a changing scene. In Adelaide, more than any other city, you feel the closeness of our early history. There's a sense of continuity. The familiar signs of modern times assault the eye in Adelaide, like everywhere else. But the hills look down on a formal plan of wide streets, parks, and colonial architecture scattered amongst the new. Noisy and confident, the city is pushing out, sprawling over the hills, eating up space where the grapes have grown, ripened and surrendered to the pickers for generations. I'm Robert Hamilton, and this is Marissou from Montpellier, France. Maris is our chief winemaker and has been with us for over 20 years. This is the original homestead, built in 1837 by my great-great-grandfather. And these are some of the first vines planted in that year. Three years afterwards, the vines bore fruit, and in 1840, the first vintage was produced of 1,200 gallons of wine. The precious soil has become real estate, and people have come to build, to establish their families, to assert their taste for goods or services, and to swell into a diverse community. But as Adelaide grew, Hamiltons have had to go elsewhere to Springton and Eden Valley in the hills 50 miles east of Adelaide and to the irrigation district of the Murray River. Away from the city, out from Adelaide. With time, new vineyards have been established and the years have brought a rich understanding of soil variations of climate. Here at Springton and Eden Valley, the high country and temperate conditions produce Rhine Riesling and Hermitage table wines whilst Yule Moselle is produced at Yule Vineyards near the sea. Hamilton's wineries have spread up the Barossa Valley and east to the Murray River. Each year, as the seasons come round, the grapes appear on the vines and begin to swell and ripen. Since classical times, the cycle has repeated itself. And for thousands of years, men have waited and wondered at the harvest and have watched the grapes grow sweeter. Sometimes, the seasons are kind. 
Sometimes the long wait ends with man watching helplessly as his crops are wrecked by storms or shrivel in the relentless heat. Maurice Hou learned winemaking in the ancient vineyards of Montpellier in southern France and graduated from the agricultural college there which specializes in enology, the science of winemaking. He came here in 1946 to stay just two years. But every summer since then, as the grapes fill with juice, he's lived close to the vines, tasting and waiting. What do you think? They are ready to pick. If it rains, it would be bad. I say we start the vintage. The picking must be completed quickly once it has been decided that the grapes are ready for pressing. At a certain point, the proportion of sugar to acid is found to be ideal for fermentation, and further ripening cannot be allowed. The first grapes to be picked are the light acid varieties growing in the high cold country. Riesling, Semillon, White Hermitage. They yield fresh, dry, delicately flavoured white table wines. The black grapes, like Shiraz and Cabernet Sauvignon, ripen longer for the red wines. And the last to be collected are those for the sweet fortified sherries and ports. To make wine, grapes can be simply crushed and allowed to stand. In time, the natural yeasts on the skin of the grape ferment and produce alcohol. With luck, a palatable wine results. But luck can no longer be regarded as a part of the process of winemaking. Tradition requires that standards are maintained. Wines must be pleasantly coloured, of good bouquet, and above all, rewarding to taste. High quality must be the aim of vintage after vintage, regardless of variations in climate and conditions. And so, tradition is guarded with scientific precision. Batch after batch of grapes are crushed in the huge vat. The juice is drained off to leave behind the skins and stalks, which must be cleaned away to prepare for a new crushing. Maurice Hu and his assistants test and calculate, hurrying between the vats and the laboratory, planning the addition of yeast cultures and spirit, the blending and storage of the wines, answering questions of taste with the slide rule. A sample of Sauterne is being tested. A sweet table wine with a low alcohol content, Sauterne spoils easily during fermentation unless a careful watch is kept. The level of sulphur dioxide in the wine is the crucial factor, and it must be maintained at a set standard. Morisu takes a certain quantity of wine and adds a few drops of starch to it. Then, from a burette, he adds a standardized solution of iodine to the wine. From this experiment, he's able to calculate the exact amount of sulfur dioxide in the wine. For when the wine solution turns dark blue, the iodine has neutralized the sulfur dioxide and the amount can be determined from the scale on the burette. A conversion is made to gallons and a decision taken on how the batches are to be treated.
dozens of decisions must be made in the early stages of the life of each wine. And in the winery, the huge quantities must be manhandled into barrels, siphoned off, labelled and stored in obedience to the laboratory. And soon, it must be left to time. The activity must cease. The wine is left to age and rest. Finally, it's the palate of the winemaker which must decide when each wine is ready to bottle. Some white wines reach maturity very quickly, even a few months after picking. But some reds may age for years in the cask before bottling. In a red table wine, a pleasant taste is sought, one with a soft finish and a good balance. The aftertaste should not be too acid. It must have a clear, deep red colour and a pleasant bouquet. This one is still a little young. Yellow is a danger signal for white wines. Ideally, they should have a greenish tinge. Yellow indicates oxidation or too long in storage. The bouquet should be reminiscent of the grape and a dry wine should be fresh and crisp. Once bottled, the still table wines must be allowed to rest again. They should be stored on their side so that the cork stays wet and airtight. Variations in temperature can stimulate undesirable character changes, so store them in a cool, even temperature. If you don't have a cellar, find a cupboard or a shelf in a dark spot. Each bottle of good wine has a character to be enjoyed. Knowledge and skill have gone into its making, and when you buy a vintage wine, you know that, of necessity, it's been carefully watched all its life. Wines are made for drinking. The care that goes into their making is something to be enjoyed and not made a cause for snobbery. Drink them in company with a meal or with simple things like cheese, olives or salty biscuits. If you have a preference for, say, the light dry reds, indulge it and drink them with whatever you like. Perhaps you prefer white wines. Well, enjoy them. But the wisest course is to have an adventurous palate, to enjoy the whole range of wine, from delicious iced Moselle to rich, mellow Burgundy, from Riesling, Hock, Chablis and Sauternes to the dry reds like Claret and Cabernet Sauvignon. Read about wine. Take an interest in it. Try the fortified wines like Hamilton's Royal Reserve Sweet Sherry or Oloroso Semi-Sweet or Golden Cream Sherry. And try Hamilton's Royal Reserve Port. Enjoy them all. The first grapevines were planted by the Hamilton family five generations ago. Today, South Australia's vineyards have become the centre of Australia's fourth largest primary industry. Hamilton's wines, founded in 1837, continue to give pleasure to lovers of good wine. <laughs>